and stations coming up on 90 seconds until the launch of hour number one of the line of fire with dr michael brown salem radio networks channel sr2 90 seconds from mark 90 seconds stations it's now one minute before the start of hour number one of the line of fire with dr michael brown one minute from mark one minute stations now the final time check before the start of hour number one of the line of fire with dr michael brown 30 seconds until hour number one from mark that was our final verbal time check for the line of fire with dr michael brown we'll have a long tone at 10 seconds before followed by a short one at five seconds have a great afternoon everybody All our attention is on Israel today. We go right into the heart of the conflict. It's time for The Line of Fire with your host, activist, author, international speaker, and theologian, Dr. Michael Brown. Your voice of moral, cultural, and spiritual revolution. Michael Brown is the director of the Coalition of Conscience and president of Fire School of Ministry. Get into The Line of Fire now by calling 866-34-TRUTH. That's 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Well, friends, we've got a whole lot of ground to cover today, Uh, a time of great shaking and pain in Israel and the Middle East, many lives in upheaval, people dying, great hardship. God cares about every single life there, both Jew, Arab, Christian, Muslim. God cares about every single one of them, and we want to, to talk about what's happening, do our best to give you a balanced perspective uh, and then at the bottom of the hour, I'm going to be joined by two guests who have documentary coming out of all times today about the Holy Land and about the, the great divides there between Israel and the Palestinians. An, an unbelievably fair, honest, compelling documentary. So this is when we had them scheduled to come on the day of the release of this. So all the more do we have a lot of really important things to talk about. I may get to some calls as well. 866-34-TRUTH. I may get to some Jewish-related calls today. We will see. So stay on the line, and we'll get to cover as much ground as we can. Okay, here's a headline from Israel. This started blaring everywhere yesterday. Look at this. Five-year-old boy killed, dozens others injured as Gaza rockets pound Israel. So here's a picture of the boy, five years old. His home in Sderot was bombed. You have to, wherever you are in Sderot, just always be within seconds of a bomb shelter. They were in the bomb shelter in their home. Every home in Israel must have a bomb shelter. Think of living like that. You must have a safe room and bomb shelter. And the bomb penetrated the shelter. He died of his wounds. Five years old. Well, let me... Let me show you this tweet that went out from a Hamas leader, the very ones that sent those bombs to kill men, women, and children in Israel. The more, the better. The more Hamas will rejoice, including Israeli children killed. Look at this tweet. The innocent Palestinian child, Hamza Nasser, 11, was on his way to buy vegetables to his family to eat it at iftar time. So that's breaking the Ramadan fast. He was hit by an Israel rocket and died immediately. He was returned to his blind mother dead. Hamza is a martyr. So that's a terrible tragedy. That's an 11-year-old that died because of an Israeli bomb. Let me tell you the difference. Israel hates that. Israel does everything in its power to avoid civilian casualties. Hamas 
just like the PLO in years past, famous for using women and children as human shields. In other words, set up your rocket launcher right in the middle of a very populous area. Set up your rocket launcher right next to a hospital or right next to a school. So if Israel takes out the bomb, the bomb squad there, there may be innocent civilian casualties. I know from people who've served in the IDF, the pains that they take to, to avoid civilian casualties. No, they're not perfect, but they go out of their way to do it. It is a fact. Whereas Hamas is seeking civilian casualties. Now, here's where it gets really sick. And, and I grieve for the people in Gaza because they're not getting a fair shake. They have been raised under oppression. Hamas is, is the savior figure for them trying to fight against the evil Israelis. I don't mean savior figure in a glorified way. You know what I'm saying. They're fighting against the monstrous occupation. Israel is just bad, evil, state-run TV, and the people have lived very difficult lives, high population density, massive unemployment. It's the fault primarily of the leaders, of the Palestinian leaders, be it the Palestinian Authority, be it Hamas, Hamas being even worse. But here's the sickest part of it. And again, I'm not saying everything Israel does is good or right. Never said that, ever. But here's, here's the real sick part of it, that the more civilians, the more children that die, the better it is for Hamas. I'm talking about Palestinian children, Palestinian civilians. The more that die, the better, because it makes Israel look bad in the eyes of the world. This is what we're dealing with, friends. May God save the, the, the leaders of Hamas, like he saved Saul of Tarsus. May he work miracles among them. But this is outright evil. These are enemies working to destroy Israel and the Jewish people living in the land. Um, Andrew, Andrew Wang, perhaps the front runner in the uh, New York City mayoral race right now, sends out this tweet. I'm standing with the people of Israel who are coming under bombardment attacks and condemn the Hamas terrorists. The people of New York City will always stand with our brothers and sisters in Israel who face down terrorism and persevere, May 10th. Good, good tweet. I agree with that. And hey, you've got several million Jews living in New York, greater New York City area. It makes sense to also make clear, hey, I'm standing with Israel against terrorism. But he ends up having to apologize for that tweet. Here, this is what he next puts out. Let's take a look at this. This is his, his next tweet. His next message says this. I spoke to a group of volunteers for their campaign yesterday, some of whom have been with me for years. Many of them were upset with my recent tweet expressing solidarity with the people of Israel in conjunction with the violence in the region this week that has claimed the lives of innocents and children on both sides. They expressed to me that they follow and support me for a number of reasons. One is that I'm a clear-headed person who follows facts. The other is that I'm a human being who stands for universal values of fellowship and goodwill. They felt that my tweet was overly simplistic in my treatment of a conflict that has a long and complex history full of tragedies. And they felt it failed to acknowledge the pain and suffering on both sides. They were, of course, correct. I mourn for every Palestinian life taken before its time as I do for every Israeli. Suffering and pain and violence and death suffered by anyone hurt us all. All people want to be able to live in peace. We all want that for ourselves and our children. Support of a people does not make one blind to the pain and suffering of others. Again, most everyone simply wants to be able to live and pray in peace. And that is what we want as well. I join with millions around the world in praying for the current situation to be uh, that the current situation be resolved as quickly as uh, as quickly peacefully as possible and with minimal suffering. For those who've spoken to me on this, thank you. Continue to believe in humanity. I appreciate his humility. I appreciate him saying he cares for all sides involved and grieves over every loss of life. Good for all of that. But don't don't step back from your initial tweet. Because Israel is not the terrorist here. Israel is not the instigator here. Israel is not the one intentionally killing civilians here. Don't equate Israel's response to terrorism with terrorism. That, that would be like equating the, the Allied bombers trying to take out Hitler and the Nazis with Hitler and the Nazis. 
you, you don't you don't do that. <clears throat> you say, no, 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 I've I've heard that Israel did provoke this. Okay, let's separate fact from fiction. I, I want to go through an article here and just read read through it. As I've looked at things, as I've analyzed things, I'd say very accurate, laid out loudly and clearly. This is from AJC Global. And uh, the article was published uh, May 10th, and it's, it's titled Four Myths and Facts About the Violence in Jerusalem. All right? Uh, yeah, Andrew Yang <laughs> said when I looked at it, I was looking at my outline in front of me. Sorry about that, folks. And uh, I said, uh, well, I'm, name it looks funny to me is just uh, on my outline in front of me. So I, I should have corrected it. My, my bad there. So I apologize for apologies for getting the name wrong. Okay. Four myths and facts about the violence in Jerusalem. As, as the final days of Ramadan drew Muslims to the Al-Aqsa Mosque to pray and the celebration of Jews, Jerusalem's reunification drew marches to the streets to celebrate, a wave of violence that had been steadily building for weeks reached a crescendo Monday as Hamas fired more than 150 rockets toward Jerusalem and various towns and cities across southern Israel, forcing millions of Israelis into bomb shelters. Here are four media myths circulating on social media, distorting the reasons behind the violence that has escalated to the brink of war. All right, before I go further in that article, let me just say a, a few things. Where is Hamas getting all the money for all these sophisticated rockets, more sophisticated than in the past, hitting Tel Aviv, hitting Galilee, so in the north, hitting Jerusalem, in places that wouldn't have been hit before? Where are they getting money from? Well, obviously, the money that pours in to the Palestinians is not going primarily to build better hospitals, better schools, better housing develop jobs, help infrastructure? No. A lot of it is going to build bombs and terror tunnels. That's where a lot of the money goes. When America foolishly gave Iran back so much of the money that was froze, about $150 billion, Iran quite blatantly put it right back into terrorism. And, and Iran is a major uh, provocateur of what is happening in the Middle East in so, so many different ways and helping to fund groups like Hezbollah, and helping to, to, to push forward groups like Hamas. So the money that could have been spent to care for the people instead is used to build bombs, and, and now things are striking in areas that haven't been hit before. So it is all the more a frontal assault on Israel and the Jewish people, and a provocation that, that Hamas in many ways had been waiting for, and apparently there is division among uh, Israeli security and, and army and different ones, government, as to how far Hamas would go. But Hamas went way further than some were expecting. Some are predicting it within the government. Some it's further than what they were expecting, worse than what they were expecting. And Israel now, even though the nation is divided with the elections and all of this, and, and Netanyahu was unable to form a new government and others were going to try to form one, and a key party to bring in was going to be an Arab party, Right now, the nation's pretty much to say Netanyahu will get the job done now, at least not, not for a new government, but right now get the job done. Uh, and, and I don't believe Israel right now is just going to say, okay, we accept another ceasefire. No, Israel is going to do what it can to decimate Hamas's ability to, to carry out what it's doing and has already uh, taken down some of the major Hamas leaders. Yeah, I agree. Those are human beings for whom Jesus died that for all we can tell are lost forever and died in rebellion and, and hatred. There's still more than the loss of, of any life. But these are people getting what's coming to them. You, you live by the sword, you're going to die by the sword. We come back, I want to go through those myths and tell you about Gil Gadot, Wonder Woman under some attack and flag. Why? Well, she's an Israeli. We'll be right back. What is the meaning of shalom? Is it just peace? Is it more than peace? When you greet someone in modern Hebrew, when you say, hey, how you doing? It's mashlamcha, which is literally, 
how is or what is your peace? Uh, how are you doing? But we use the word shalom there broadly. When you greet someone, shalom. When you leave, shalom. So it, it can have so many different meanings in modern Hebrew. But biblical Hebrew, what, is, what does it mean? Well, the root primarily does not have to do with peace, but with completeness or wholeness. A, a part of the root can be used for, for, for repaying or something like that, recompense. So the word itself is not about rest or peace as much as, as fullness, wholeness, completeness. And, and hence, shalom is overall well-being. It is wholeness of, of life, wholeness of mind, body, spirit. A beautiful verse in Isaiah, the 26th chapter, it, it says this, and, and I'll quote it in Hebrew, Yetzer, Yetzer Samuch, Titzor Shalom, Shalom, Kivacha Batuach. You keep him in perfect peace whose mind and stayed in you because he trusts in you. Perfect peace in Hebrew is Shalom, Shalom. So Shalom is not just peace, but well-being. It is wholeness. It is not so much fullness in the sense of overflowing. There are other words for that. But the life that is blessed is a life at shalom. So it is peace because all is well. The false prophets would say shalom, shalom, ve'en shalom. They'd say all is well, all is well, when nothing is well. To say Shalom, Lee. It's all good. It is well with my soul. That's really the heart essence of shalom. And for a whole people, that's what it's talking about. It's the Line of Fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Get into the Line of Fire now by calling 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. I've been nailing it with the, the names today in the midst of this very important discussion. Yeah, it's a typo on the outline I was handed. It said Wang instead of Yang, but I should have corrected that. I know the man's name. And then Gal Gadot. Yeah, well, I, when I said Gil, I said, no, Gil's a male name. Gal, yeah, yeah. And Gadot, I was just kind of pronouncing the Hebrew the way I thought it should be, but it's Gadot. And anyway, anyway, thanks to my raise a sharp team for catching that back to the stuff that it really matters. Let, let's, let's take a look at this article uh, about some of the myths about what's happening today and what provoked this. All right. So myth number one, myth number one, Israeli police have launched an assault on the Al-Aqsa mosque at the end of Ramadan. That, that's a myth. Fact. The violence we're seeing is the result of Palestinian incitement, not Israeli aggression. In the days leading up to the riots in the Temple Mount compound, Palestinians stockpiled stone slabs, rocks, and fireworks around the site. Thousands of worshippers leaving Friday prayer hurled rocks at Israeli police officers guarding the site who responded accordingly. Videos from inside the mosque show stun grenades landing inside prayer rooms as projectiles used to disperse the crowds outside have gone through doors left wide open. Leaving the worship space more vulnerable amplifies the bogus battle cry that Al-Aqsa is in danger which has served to foment protests and violence for years. In other words, it's a very holy, sacred site, third holiest in Islam. Meanwhile, Iran's meddling is inflaming tensions as well. Ahead of Jerusalem Day, which has long been a flashpoint on Iran's calendar, Iran's Ayatollah Ali Khamenei wrote that the Palestinians' endeavors in the pure blood of resistance martyrs have managed to multiply Palestinian jihad's eternal power, internal power by hundreds of times, once Palestinian youth defended themselves by throwing stones, but today they respond to the enemy attacks with precision missiles. Social media also has been weaponized by Arab youth to agitate far more violence. Throughout the past month, a new social media trend arose that involved physically assaulting visibly Orthodox Jews and posting the attacks on TikTok. And by the way, there's like civil war now in cities where Jews and Arabs live side by side, Israelis and Palestinians side by side. And now there's violence exploding. I mean, it's, it's a real, real difficult time. Myth number two, the so-called assault on Al-Aqsa is a Jewish effort to support, suppress religious freedom. Fact, never in history has there been greater religious freedom and protection for all worshipers in Jerusalem than there has been since Israel took control of the city in 1967. When Jordan ruled the city, Jews were denied access to the Western Wall and to the cemetery on the Mount of Olives, where Jews have buried their dead for more than 2,500 years. 
Nearly 60 synagogues were destroyed or turned into stables or chicken coops, and Jewish tombstones were ground up and used to pave roads. Jordan also passed laws that banned Christian institutions from acquiring real estate and limited how many Christian schools could open. After the 1967 war, Israel abolished all of Jordan's discriminatory laws and made it illegal to restrict access to sacred places. Israel also entrusts the oversight of the holy places to their respective religious authorities. For example, the Muslim Waqf oversees the mosques on the Temple Mount while Israel oversees security. Now, here's the, the, another big one. Uh, WWE wrestler on SmackDown wrestles by the name of Sami Zayn. He, he tweeted out, uh, let, me, let me get this. A friend just sent this to me. Uh, yeah, let, let me just read this to you, then we'll go back to He tweeted out this saying, uh, let me get it. There is no viable moral defense for stealing people's homes based on their ethnicity. So what's that charge about? Okay, let, let's, go, let's go back to the article. This is myth number three. The eviction of 30-plus families from their homes in Sheikh Jarrah, a neighborhood in East Jerusalem, is an example of ethnic cleansing. You probably heard that. It's just, it's everywhere. Fact. First of all, the case centers on six families, so not 30. Second, the Israeli Supreme Court hasn't ruled on whether the landowners can evict the families who have been at-will tenants on the land since the 1980s. But rather than wait for a court decision, Palestinians have made the families cause celebs, inciting violent clashes with Israeli police and Jewish extremists. The dispute in Sheikh Jarrah originated in 1876 when the land, which houses the tomb of a revered Jewish high priest from antiquity, was under Ottoman rule. That year, Palestinian landowners sold the land to two Jewish trusts. Jordan captured the plot in the Arab-Israeli War of 1948 and built dozens of homes there to house Palestinian families who had fled from what became Israel. After Israel captured East Jerusalem in 1967, Jews were allowed to reclaim property that was under Jewish ownership before 1948. The Jewish trusts resumed ownership of the homes on the lot, but later sold it. The new landowners have tried to evict the residents ever since. Now the issue lies with the Israeli Supreme Court and Israel's attorney general. The court had urged the parties to try to reach a compromise last week, but the Palestinian residents refused. The hearing slated to take place this week was postponed at the attorney general's request in order to avoid further inflaming tensions in the city. That's the truth about the so-called ethnic cleansing. That's the story. There is no ethnic cleansing. There's a decades-long legal battle. <clears throat> but who cares when you can inflame hatred against the Jewish people with a single tweet or with a single piece of misinformation? Uh, last, last myth, myth number four. This violence is all about sovereignty, the battle over the sovereignty in Jerusalem. And this, this goes through the reality there, what's actually happening, what the real issues are. But it is, it is not that, in, in short, the conflict over Jerusalem is fueling only part of the tension. The internal rivalry between two Palestinian political parties, Hamas and Fatah, and Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas's decision to yet again postpone elections, also explains some of the violence because Hamas doesn't have a strong presence in Jerusalem. The terrorist group has co-opted this conflict and enlisted Palestinians in Jerusalem to help reach their goals. But, but hey, why, why worry about facts when, when you can inflame hatred against Israel and, and the Jewish people? Okay, check this out. Check this out. Breitbart, so strongly conservative website, breitbart.com, Look at this series of headlines there from today. Riots in Israel. Shouts of Allahu Akbar as Jewish man stabbed. Israeli flags burned. Synagogues attacked in Germany. Chicago cheers. Palestinian terror attacks. Gal Gadot, pro-Israel comments ripped apart by entertainment media. Now, yeah, this is a conservative pro-Israel site, bizarrely. People accuse it of being anti-Semitic in years past. It's utterly ridiculous. In any case, in any case, what did Gal Gadot actually say? Yes, she's Israeli, served in the IDF, as, as most all Israelis do. You're required to, unless you're ultra-Orthodox, can be exempt. Otherwise, you're, you're required to serve men and women, women for two years, men for three years. So you get out of high school, do that, then go to college. Uh, but what did she say that was so terrible, so controversial? Are you ready? I'm going to read it to you. <clears throat> My heart breaks 
my country is at war. I worry for my family, my friends. I worry for my people. This is a vicious cycle that has been going on for far too long. Israel deserves to live as a free and safe nation. Our neighbors deserve the same. Speaking of the Palestinians and others in the region, our neighbors deserve the same. I pray for the victims and their families. I pray for this unimaginable hostility to end. I pray for our leaders to find the solution so we could live side by side in peace. I pray for better days. What a great message. As an Israeli, of course, she cares about her people, her family, her friends. Of course, I, I'm, I'm getting information, you know, where, where the five-year-old boy was killed in Steyrot. One of my colleagues who graduated from our ministry school sends a note that I, I think his sister-in-law or family member lives just right down the block from there. And this is real life. These are people we love under attack, having to huddle in bomb shelters. And, and I've, been, I've been told that, you know, the bomb's dropping. and It's, it's absolutely terrifying. And, and you can do nothing. You just you have to wait and so on. It's, it's very intense. And, I mean, think of it. Every home, remember, every home in Israel must have a bomb shelter. You live in an apartment building. They must have bomb shelters with them. But you have to have a safe room with your family. It doesn't matter if you have a little house. You must have a room that's a, a safe room, bomb shelter, basement, whatever the thing is. And, and you live in Stay Road. You just have seconds because that's so close to Gaza. You have seconds. Whatever you're doing, taking a shower, playing with the kids on the street, you have seconds to get into a bomb shelter. They have to be all over the place. And... You have little children, elementary school children, suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder because of, of the bombings and the constant onslaught that they experience. So, of course, she's concerned about her people. But, but friends, she's concerned about the neighbors. She wants, she wants them to... Yeah, she, she wants them to be taken care of. She's concerned about the Palestinians and hates the loss of life and hopes leaders can sit down so people can live at peace together. But here, typical, this is the typical propaganda out there. Uh, I would say this gentleman is from Pakistan, if I was guessing with the last name Shah. Fayez Shah just posted openly on our Facebook page. Israel is making garden for their own children and hell for others' children, for others' children, is in human behavior. That's what happens when people believe the lies. That's what happens when people believe the propaganda. And, and when we pray for the peace of Jerusalem, if there's peace in Jerusalem, there's peace in the region, friends. So I'll, I'll stop here where I started. God cares about every human being in the region. But you better believe Israel is under attack by terrorists. That's a fact. And, and I'm glad that President Biden, although his policy direction has been bad, and wanting to work again with Iran the way he does is terribly dangerous. I'm glad that he did tell Prime Minister Netanyahu, yes, you have a right to defend against terror. I'd like it to be an even more forceful statement, but I'm glad at least that call was made. We come back, we're going to talk about a documentary that really gives both sides of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. I mean, it is an eye-opener. Fayaz, this is something you need to watch, sir. This is something you need to watch. As an atheist, that no real atheist exists, that everybody really knows there's a God. Well, I don't agree with that. And my wife, Nancy, who was an atheist when we met at 19 and a hardcore atheist that dad had been ever since she was maybe eight years old, she absolutely takes offense in that statement. Now, if you mean scientifically that it's impossible to prove the non-existence of God and therefore you cannot scientifically demonstrate that. Okay, that's another subject. But are there people who sincerely and genuinely in the heart of hearts do not believe that there is a God, that there's anything beyond the material realm? Certainly. Do some of them hate the God? They do not. Exodus chapter 20, verse 5. Exodus chapter 20, verse 5. In the Ten Commandments, God speaks about the idols. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. So, yes, there are some people who hate God. They see who he is. They see what he stands for. They believe he's real, and they hate him. 
There are others that deny his existence, but act as if they hate him. You know, the summary of many of the new atheist books, the Richard Dawkins, Christopher Hitchens books, the, the best summary of some of them is, there is no God and I hate him. So there are some people who hate what this God stands for or hate what they believe this God has done in the name of religion or hate the God of the Old Testament, but they deny his existence. So that's an interesting thing. But, but there are other atheists that simply intellectually or experientially don't believe there's a God. And they don't go around hostile and angry towards him all the time. That's a fact. And there are others, and I want to appeal to this, who I believe have a very high and lofty view of God and think that if this God existed, who was so good, who was so perfect, who was so powerful, he couldn't possibly allow the suffering and pain in this world. He would have to intervene more than he has. So I believe for some atheists, their rejection of God is because of a pain in their heart, not so much an anger, but they prayed and didn't find an answer, that they once believed the Bible, but it seemed in their critical, deepest, darkest moment that this God let them down, or they just hurt so much for a hurting human race, they can't understand how an omnipotent, loving being with all wisdom and all foreknowledge could let this happen, let a world be like this. So I believe there's much to appeal to in those people and to say, the God you dream about is actually real beyond your wildest dreams. You just don't have the capacity to fully understand him. I want to introduce you to that God. It's The Line of Fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown, your voice of moral, cultural, and spiritual revolution. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Thanks, friends, for joining us on The Line of Fire. It's Thoroughly Jewish Thursday as we're in the midst of massive conflict in Israel, what could turn into a, a major war. I looked at my calendar. I thought, I cannot believe that this is the day that we had scheduled to have two guests joining me, Justin Cron and Todd Moorhead, who have produced an extraordinary documentary, Hope for the Holy Land. It, it releases midnight tonight. You can find out more by going to watch.salem.com, Hope for the Holy Land. But rather than rescheduling because I was having guests, I thought, what a perfect time to have them on. Because as, as I watch this documentary, I get sent stuff constantly. Can you watch this, review this? And the vast, vast majority, we just have to respectfully decline. But I watched this whole video, and I, I was stunned by how fair it was and how it really got you into the heart of Palestinians and, and how they'll, they view Israel. Israelis, how they view the Palestinians and, and, and how they see the conflict and, and the conclusions they came to, I thought were so powerful. So Todd, Justin, welcome to the broadcast. Thank hey, you, Mike Brown. How are you? Great. Yeah, and we great all, almost nailed it with both of you at the exact same time. Next time I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you one at a time. Almost got that perfect. Um, so let's, let's just first very quickly, cause I want to focus on this documentary and then get your comments on how it can help in the midst of the conflict today, especially Christians around the world watching and trying to figure out how to sort this out. So uh, go uh, with each of you, but Todd first, then Justin, how is it that you got such a burden for Israel, for the Holy Land? Yeah, um, I became a believer in Jesus really young, like four years old. And it just seems that with that um, confession of faith, even at four um, the love for the Jewish people follows suit. Mm. I don't even, I don't, I don't actually know when it happened. It was just there. It was always there. And um, it's not something my, my parents were both believers, but they didn't instill it in me. Um, I just think it was a, a God given thing. And I thought everybody, I thought every Christian mm. had the same love for the Jewish people in Israel. Um, tur turns out that's not the case. <laughs> so it was just something in your heart from a little boy. Interesting. All right, uh, Justin, how, how did you develop this love for, for Israel, the Jewish people, the, the larger region? Yeah, well, for me, I come from a, a Jewish background. I'm a Jewish uh, follower of Jesus, 
And so like you've probably heard before, uh, Michael, you, you can take the Jew out of the land, but you can't take the land out of the Jew. Mm. Um, it's just a part of who we are. And so, you know, a lot of that just came from influence in my family. Uh, but then even even more so, just as I grew in my faith, uh, you read the Bible, and obviously Israel is a very, very central part uh, of, of God's redemptive story, and uh, that God was never going to give up on the people of Israel uh, despite their disobedience or, or lack of faith. Uh, and so my heart followed suit in just wanting to help my people, uh, our people, better understand uh, God's heart for them. And, and then that carried into wanting to help the church uh, learn that heart as well. Uh, all right. A follow-up question, Justin, before I go back to Todd. It seems, though, based on what you've produced in this in this documentary, that you also have a tremendous heart for for the Palestinians. Where'd that come from? Well, I'll jump in there on that. I, I was challenged uh, by someone uh, at the church that I was attending who was getting more and more engaged with learning about the conflict from, from both sides of the issues. And his challenge to me was, Justin, if your theology does not lead you to love your neighbor and your enemy, then something is wrong with your theology. And I was challenged right in that moment, realizing I've got some soul work uh, I need to do in my own life as, as regards to just God's heart for the Arab people, and in particular, the Palestinians who uh, are often characterized as as Israel's uh, enemies. And so uh, that's really kind of what propelled me um, to just want to consider more uh, of, you know, just God's heart for the, for the Arab people. Got it. Got it. And, and Todd, you're kind of like the, the California surfer dude that just going around the land talking to people in a way just very, very sincere, w- without guile. How did this impact you? Let's let's first talk about the the worldview of the Palestinians, how they see their situation, and and questions it raised for you in the new documentary Hope for the Holy Land. So, how did it impact you? What insights did it give you? Yeah, um, actually, getting on the ground and talking to a lot of Palestinians, um, we spent a good deal of time in the West Bank, Judea, Samaria just doing what we called man-on-the-street interviews, pulling people aside, asking them if we could ask them some questions on camera. And uh, I learned a lot about their society and, and just and some of the stuff that I heard um, just it make, made me cringe. Um, the hatred for the Jewish people, of, for not for Jewish people in particular, but for Zionists. For once it, and I found out once a Jewish person has any mass, national... Um, and you know, inspiration, then aspiration. Sorry, then then there are problems. So the hatred for the Zionists and and really Jews living in the land, um, and just this uh, cultural anti-Semitism, which was pervasive everywhere we went. Um, so there was that aspect of it, which which was very um, it felt very heavy and somewhat hopeless. But then I would meet. Uh, other Palestinians um, who, you know, who are courageously um, standing, you know, standing against the Palestinian narrative uh, that we hear so often, and they're willing to make friends with Jewish people, and they're willing to tell the truth, um, and they're w- willing to, um, yeah, stand up for what's right at the at the risk of their life, really. So mm. I saw two opposite sides, um, and and that's showcased in the movie and and that last night is the one that we want to uphold those um you know Dietrich Bonhoeffer type Arab Palestinians that are so courageous and standing against the culture norms of of, of what they know mm. and, and and Justin as a, a Jewish believer in Jesus when you were watching this footage and and you know interacting with Todd about it interacting with people on the street was there anything in 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 quote the quote Palestinian narrative, the, the one that is really hostile to the Jewish people and to the state of Israel? Was there anything in their story that either challenged your view of history or further sensitized you towards their situation? How did it affect you? 
Yeah, I, I'll you know just confirm with Todd just to say that the anti-Semitism that uh, we heard and, and saw that was startling for me. I've never seen anything that blatant or heard anything that blatant. But um, to hear more of their story and uh, just the fact that I think we need to be honest as, as those who support Israel, that the establishment of the state of Israel was messy. And Zionists, um, you know, some of them did some pretty bad things to the Arab people. Uh, at that time. And, and, you know, we're even seeing some of that happen right now. Um, You know, not every Jewish person uh, does what's right in in the eyes of God and sometimes can can do things to the other uh, that that dishonors God. And and so, you know, to to learn a bit more about that history, I think, helped sensitize me a bit to the frustration that some of them had uh, in regards to the to the establishment of the state uh, of Israel. But, but you were still jarred, even though you've known about anti-Semitism, read about it, experienced it on some levels, you were still jarred to, to see it at that level, that openly expressed, which, which is quite striking. W- was there, Todd, in, in your heart, a similar experience dealing with, with the Israelis? Did they have the same hostility towards the Palestinians? Did they view them all as terrorists? Um, did you find courageous Israelis? trying to make peace, or did they have to be courageous? What, what was your experience on the other side? Yeah, so we did man-on-the-street interviews as well um, on the other side in Tel Aviv and other places as well. And uh, just about the vast majority of Israeli Jews that I interviewed were um, pretty sympathetic to Palestinians. A number of them said, I think they should have their own state. They should be able to live their lives in peace. Um so quite the opposite of what we heard in the Palestinian territory. Mm. Um, and even with the settlers that I met, I didn't hear any um, hostility towards Palestinians. They really wanted to be neighbors. And actually, these settlers were neighbors. They were the ones with the most uh, relationships with Palestinians out of um, all the Israelis that I met. And of course, that you know those are the ones I met. And we know there's fringe elements where there's uh, racism and, and hatred um, on the Jewish side as well, like Justin said, but um, not the ones that I met. And, and we didn't cherry pick them. We just did man on the street interviews. And that's just what we found out. Yeah. So friends, again, this, this is a documentary that will give you insight into both sides. I mean, you'll watch it and you'll think, wow, they really got this. They really understand. And, You'll see as Todd's talking, he's, he's not arguing a point. He's asking questions and, and probing. But in the end, it, it, it seems clear that one side really wants peace in a way that the other doesn't. Um, we've got to go a, a lot deeper. By the way, if you're, if you're watching, we've got two different um, faces coming up as, as our guests are speaking. And if one gets confused with the other, uh, the voice remains the same. So we're good there. But, uh, Justin, what's the best way? I, I mentioned one website, but the simplest way for people to find out how they, can, how they can rent this or buy it or perhaps show it in their churches, what's the best website to go to? Yeah, go directly to the film website, which is hopeintheholyland.com. And hope in the Holy Land, not for, <laughs> hopeintheholyland.com. All right, I'm typing it in now, hopeintheholyland.com. And... Yeah, there we are, delving beneath the surface of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Uh, Yossi Klein Halevi, author of Letters to My Palestinian Neighbors, said this beautiful, politically nuanced and morally sensitive film models the approach to the Palestinian-Israeli conflict that I'd long hoped to see among Christians, an open heart to the two indigenous, traumatized peoples of the Holy Land. Friends, it, if you care about Israel and you care about the Palestinians, it's really must watch. I, I was blown away by what I saw. We'll be right back. This is a Love Language Minute. Here's Dr. Gary Chapman on Headship in Marriage. 
when we think of Judaism, we're not just thinking of one whole faith that is the same in every way. Just like within Christianity, you have Catholics, Protestants, you have Eastern Orthodox. Within Protestantism, you have Evangelicals, you have Pentecostals, Charismatics, you have these different groups and subgroups. It's the same with Judaism. In ancient times, as well as today. So today, the three main branches of Judaism are Orthodox, conservative, which does not mean morally conservative, but Orthodox, conservative, and reform. Even to the left of reform is Reconstructionist. To the right of Orthodox is modern Orthodox, excuse me, ultra-Orthodox, and within that, Hasidic ultra-Orthodox Jews. So you have these, these different groups, these different spectrums, but in the ancient world, in the days of Jesus, the apostles, there were, there were three main groups. Look at what Paul says, and it's Acts the 23rd chapter. When Paul perceived that one part of the Sanhedrin, one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, brothers, I am a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees. It is respect, with respect to the hope and resurrection of the dead that I'm on trial. And when he had said this, a dissension arose between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. So he knew the differences. So the Sadducees held to the five books of Moses only. They did not believe in the future resurrection of the dead. They were temple-based. The Pharisees believed that they had oral traditions that were passed on through the generations. They ultimately said going all the way back to Moses. And they wanted all Jews to live in a sense of ritual purity and they established synagogues in different areas. They're the ones that survived. Orthodox Jews today can trace directly back to the Pharisees. And then the Essenes, Qumran, Dead Sea Scrolls, they separated from the other groups and lived in a monastic way. Evolution. Get into the line of fire now by calling 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Welcome back, friends, to The Line of Fire on Thoroughly Jewish Thursday. I'm joined by Todd Moorhead and Justin Cron. They've put together this extraordinary documentary, Hope for the Holy Land. Hopefully we're okay with our sound here. Uh, Todd, what type of, of responses are you getting? Um, hang on. Let's, let's find out what happened to our guests during the break. So team over uh the studio if you could just check that out and find out what happened so we can get our guests back on just give me the go ahead um when we're good so grayson and team please let me know what's going on um just to say this i i was looking at some of the endorsements for the video in advance and i was i was blown away i and then i watching i thought it, it's deserved. It's really deserved. And again, it's something that's been very important to me for years. But to do my best to understand the other position before I engage it, to, to do my best to get into the skin of someone who sees things differently, interprets the Bible differently, has a different worldview, It'd be the same with secular issues, social issues, to, to do my best to see through other eyes so that I could present their position in a way that would satisfy them. In other words, I could say, so are you saying this, this, and this? Are you saying this, this, and this? Is that your point? Yes. Okay, great. I see your point. Let me tell you why I still have a difference. Or, wow, I never saw it from that angle. Or I never thought of that before. Or whatever the case is. And that's what's so compelling about this video that it, it really gets you in the shoes of others and, and helps you to see the world through their eyes. So, so Todd, um, what type of responses are you getting? I just read one extraordinary one from a, a very fair-minded Israeli author. What are you hearing from, from others who've endorsed the video? Yeah, one of the common threads that we're hearing is that it's um, the most fair and balanced film on the conflict they've ever seen. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's a bit, that's, a big statement because it's so difficult to be fair and balanced. And, and Todd, what was, what was in your heart through this? In, in other words, did you have the heart of someone that had a position to argue 
or someone that was really coming to, to find out what was in people's hearts with the heart of a Christian peacemaker yourself? Yeah, I, I for the most part, I had the heart of uh, somebody who was on the kind of exploring, on a, a journey of discovery. Um, the only time, you know, and especially during those man on the street interviews and all the people I met, and the only time I, um, I, I felt like I had a little more of my guard up was when I was talking, when I had an interview with a Palestinian liberation theologian. And, um, and it was so, it, there's so many challenges yeah. that I think yeah. you probably know what I'm talking about because you've been in that situation at crisis checkpoint. Um, there's so many challenges with the theology that I could have argued vir- virtually every point and I had to just breathe and uh, let the, uh, let the guy talk for himself and let people listen. And, you know, my, my main job was not to confront some of these things, but, um, for the most part, it was a heart of, um, uh, going to learn, hearing people on the ground. Yeah. And I, like them. I could see even during that interview, you didn't come in expecting to hear those reinterpretations and misinterpretations of the, of the Bible. And yet here they were coming up lately, but, but still you, you spoke in a civil way and got the information. And it's just there for people to evaluate. Uh, and, um, Justin, as we go back to you, what what's your hope? You made this especially for a Christian audience. The Christian evangelicals have been the greatest friends of Israel in decades, and yet much of the younger generation coming up has different values. Much of the college campuses where they go to study have different values. Uh, is your goal to get everyone to become a Christian Zionist by watching this? Uh, what, what, what's, what's the goal of the video from your viewpoint, Justin? Yeah, I, I mean, if you're, you're a follower of Jesus, I, I definitely want you to be a Zionist. I, I definitely want you to support Israel's right to exist. And, and you know, what is that? that that's about a, a Jewish self-determination within their ancestral homeland. Uh, I, I think every Christian should support that. It, it, so if we understand Christian Zionism as that, then yes. Uh, I also think that the Jewish community, what they need to see uh, when they're being attacked, and I'm not talking about being physically attacked, but what we're seeing is a, is a cognitive assault against the legitimacy of the Jewish nation, then we as followers of Jesus, if, if we take the Bible seriously, uh, we need to stand in the gap for our neighbor, and, and we need to come to their defense. And so a lot of the, why we made the film for, for me, and, and I know for Todd too, is just about standing up for the, the Jewish people. Uh, and I think that they, they need to see that kind of action uh, from from followers of Jesus, uh, whether you're from a Jewish background or not. All right, so, so Justin, let me just push back on that for one second. Then why paint the Palestinians in such sympathetic light? Why be so fair-minded to their side? Why not just try to paint a distorted picture to get people to be pro-Israel, why why put out a documentary that is definitely going to give people much more of a heart of love and compassion for the Palestinian people? Why do that in your documentary? Because you'll never look into the eyes of someone who doesn't matter to God. Mm. Uh, whether whether you're you're Jewish or Arab, you matter to him. Uh, and and you know, here's something else I think we need to remember is, is that. You know, we kind of look at the conflict as black and white, one side being all good, the other all bad, mm-hmm. or all good, all evil. But but let's be honest here. Uh, we're, we're talking about really two secular nations, uh, you know, two, two nations, neither one of which has surrendered their hearts to God. Now, there are individuals within these societies— uh, who have done that or who are on the way to doing that, who maybe have a higher regard for the teaching of, of Scripture than, than the other. Um, but, you know, we're, we're talking about two nations, two unbelieving nations. And, and I also think, too, we need to see that there's also two groups of people in this, in this conflict. There are those who are for peace, and there are those who are not for peace. And you can be a Palestinian who is for peace. And if you're that person, then we want to give some platform and, and volume to that voice. Got it. Got it. And, and that you do. And you see the courage 
the Palestinians saying, look, we want a better life. Here's the way to have a better life. Here's the way that's not going to happen. Here's the way it can happen. Hey, Todd, you get the last word in, and then we'll give the website one more time. But we've just got about two minutes. What What is your hope for a Christian who watches this video? What What are you hoping will happen in their own heart and life? Yeah, if they already love the Jewish people, I hope it spurs them on to love them even more. Um, if they are on the opposite side of the spectrum and they have sympathy towards the Palestinians but not the Jewish people, I, I just hope and pray that they will gain God's heart for the Jewish people. Um, um, for those Christians who, um, for the Christian Zionists already, like me, um, I can say for myself that we need to have God's heart for the Palestinians. As Justin said, they're creating God's image. So uh, I would like to challenge my own camp from the Christian Zionist perspective to gain God's heart for the Palestinian people. Mm. What what does that heart look like? Yep. So it's really a challenge for everybody. Yeah, and you know, wherever God finds us, He's going to challenge us. There's going to be something where you know, on our best day, He challenges us because we're self righteous and proud. You know, and in our theological orthodoxy, He challenges us because we've grown spiritually cold. And in our spiritual passion, He challenges us because we we forget about our neighbor while loving God. You know, there, there's always something, some blind spot. And, and again, that's Honestly, I can say it is the most balanced presentation of the conflict in Israel, in the Holy Land, that I've yet seen. So, hopeintheholyland.com, correct? That's correct, correct. All right, that's that's the place to go. Look, it, it takes a lot of funding to make this happen. That's why this is something that you pay to watch, just like when you go to the movies, you pay to watch it, and you understand it, it, it's a lot of time a lot of effort, a lot of travel, filming, interviewing, editing things, putting out the final project. So you'll want to see this. You'll be edified. It'll, it, it, it's absolutely worth it. And then spread the word to others, especially now. If there was a day for this to come out, a week for it to come out, it's now. Hopeintheholyland.com. I don't make a dime for promoting any of this. My whole goal is to stand with God's heart for the people living in greater Israel today, Israelis, Palestinians, Jews, Muslims, Christians. Let's have God's heart together. Hey, guys, thanks for your hard work in making this available. May, may the Lord stun you with what he does with this documentary. Thank you so Thank much, you, Michael. Dr. Really appreciate your support. Absol absolutely. From the heart, man. From the heart. All right. Hey, we're, we're out of time, but I've got, I've got good news. 16 minutes from now, I'll be right back here in the same studio, behind the same microphone, talking to you on YouTube. So join me 16 minutes from now, 4.15 Eastern time, ASK Dr. Brown, Ask Dr. Brown over on YouTube. We'll do our weekly exclusive YouTube chat right there. You don't want to miss it. Tell your friends. All questions, welcome. Welcome.